Thanks for joining us this morning, and we'll have uh, Dean Corgan kind of start stuff off. All right, so I was trying to think about what to tell you, and there's, you know, how, most of you were at orientation, so I didn't want to recap what we did at orientation, right? We gave you sort of things that you, you know, top 10 things or top 14 things you really should do. Those are really helpful, so go do those if you haven't yet, right? So refer back to that. But I didn't want to repeat that and talk about the kind of perfunctory steps. I thought instead maybe I'd take a kind of broader view of what it takes for you to get to know yourself and turn yourself into the successful person you want to be. And obviously you've already begun doing that or are doing it very well because you're here. Um, but I thought I'd kind of focus on uh, choosing the road to success because I, uh, what I'm going to argue today is that it really is a choice and it's an active choice that you either make or don't make uh, on a pretty regular daily basis, maybe multiple times a day. And uh, it's not just choosing it, but it's having the right tools to have those choices be meaningful and turn into something positive. And so, you know, I sort of was thinking it's sort of choosing and hacking for the journey down the road to success. So choosing success. Um, you know, you, you probably have heard for many, many years that you need to use active voice uh, in your writing, right? No passive voice, you know, be an active thinker, be an active writer, uh, own your ideas. Uh, that's all very true. And similarly, I think you have an active choice every day about how you're going to move from where you are to where you want to be. And that's how I'll define success for today, right? Success not in somebody else's eyes, not in society's eyes, but success in terms of where you are now and where you want to be, right? And so where you want to be at the end of the semester, where you want to be at the end of this academic year, where you want to be at the end of your graduate program. Right? So let's say for now that's sort of the, the, the vision of success that we're looking at. So you define it for yourself. Um, so success, I would argue, is not about luck. Like sometimes students will come to me and say, oh, I've been really successful, I've been really lucky, you know, this happened and that happened. And it's true. It, it can sometimes feel like success is not something that's part of you, but something that's external to you, right? that's in the world, that kind of happens to you if you're lucky, or doesn't happen to you if you're not fortunate. I would argue that it really isn't an accident, it isn't luck, it isn't a surprise, that in fact success is a choice. And it's one that as a graduate student, you have a series of choices to make before you. Uh, and I want to talk through what some of those are and how making the right decisions and the right choices along the path can help you, you know, get to where you want to be or succeed. Right? So um, success is really the result, I would argue, of interior things, things that are internal to you that you have control over, like the choices that you make daily. They shape your success. So when you decide today to get up, even though it's a Friday, even though it's Friday before a long weekend, even though you probably are dying for a long weekend after probably a pretty intense couple weeks, you made the choice to get up and come here, right? That was a good choice probably. It's going to help you another step on that road to success compared to all the folks who didn't make that choice today, right? Um, so it's good strategy, right? And having a strategy for how you're going to get through a class your semester, your thesis, your dissertation, your comprehensive exams. Uh, you need strategy, you need good intentions, you need to make good choices on a daily basis that help your, helps your plan move forward, um, and it plays out in ways that move you forward. Right? And in doing so, you'll face challenges. It's not that you, can, you have total control. There will be unexpected surprises. Maybe your goals will shift a little bit. Maybe you'll be in an environment where there's an unexpected challenge that really didn't fit the plan you laid out for the semester. Uh, these things happen, but the key is, as they happen, recognize that it's inevitable that they happen first, right? Can't fight that. Uh, but when unexpected things happen, it's really about adjusting those strategies, those plans, and those choices in order to get you to where you want to be, right? So you really are, are in the process right now, this month, of making that big step up from undergrad to grad, because it is not the same, right? I think it's really important, I know you know that, but I think it's important to have that validated by others, like us, that um, it doesn't feel the same to be a grad student as it does an undergrad. So if you're feeling a little like, wait a minute, I was a superstar undergrad, and now I'm feeling a little overwhelmed, or maybe I'm, you know, there are all these other smart people in my classes, they're really smart, right? It's because you've now stepped up with all of the other sort of creme de la creme into another, into another sort of level of achievement, right? And so that pathway isn't linear. It's not like you finish undergrad and then it's another little baby step into grad school. It's a big step up. The expectations go up, right? The quality and caliber of the students that are in your classes goes up, right? Uh, the expectations from faculty members increase, right? So it's a big step up, but it's an exciting step. And it's a step that I'm here to tell you and reassure you, you are prepared to make that step, 
right? We wouldn't have invited you to come to graduate school if the graduate college, your faculty, your departments didn't think that you had the tools to be successful making this big step, right? So the question is, now that you're in the process of it, what are the next steps down the line to keep you on that road to success? So I think the first place to start is within you, right? And I'm not a psychologist, so it's a little odd for me as a sociologist, we've got two of us on the panel, uh, to focus on the interior of you, because sociologists are really all about the interactions that you have with others, and that's coming next. But I think the reality is you do have to start by knowing yourself, right? And I think at this point in taking this big step up into grad school, it's the right time for you to be honest with yourself about what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, because we all have them. And I'm here to tell you that as much as it might feel like you have to be a uh, superman or a superwoman to be in grad school, uh, at the same time, everybody has their kryptonite. Right? Everybody has their, um, their weaknesses. Some people aren't good with certain computers or statistics or with library research. Um, that's inevitable. Don't beat yourself up over it. Don't try and repress it and deny it and hope that it doesn't follow you. Right? Now's a good moment to sort of assess what you have in your suitcase that's traveling with you through grad school. You know, your set of strengths and skills and your set of maybe weaknesses or challenges that pose an opportunity for you to improve in those areas, right? And if you can recognize those and start working on it, now's a great time to do that. It's much harder if you kind of, you know, repress those and have to deal with it later when you're trying to write your thesis or do your dissertation. Um, you have lots more pressures on you. So know yourself and you know, sort of assess where you are now. Um, and it should be assess, not access. Uh, you are expected to be proactive. One of my colleagues in the grad college uh, used to always say, uh, when students would come in and say, oh, you know, this or that or the other thing. I, I didn't know I needed this form. I didn't know I had to apply for graduation. Oh, you know, uh, could somebody walk me through campus to all these different offices to do the things I need to do? And, and my colleague always used to say, you got to figure out that they're in big kid school, <laughs> right? And so I don't say that in an irreverent way. I say it in, in so far as we think of you now as the professional that you want to become. You're not a, you're not a first year undergrad student, you're not someone that we see needs a lot of guidance and intervention. Your faculty, your department, your colleagues here on campus think of you as a burgeoning colleague, right? And so that really means that um, you need to sort of take responsibility for yourself uh, and to recognize where you need to build relationships and get help and where you already have strengths and to you know, continue to hone those strengths and then maybe share those strengths with others around you. And that'll come in a second. So I'd encourage you to be proactive. That's really what we mean when we say, you know, big kids will. It really is on you to go out there and, and, and create your path. And so one way to do that is to be involved and engaged, right? GPSA, you're obviously here and already doing that, so it's a great start. Stay engaged, right? Uh, go to social events, participate in activities on campus, whatever speaks to you. Most importantly, get involved in your department. Get to know your other peers and grad students, your faculty. Many departments do social events or have brown bags or research uh, sort of meetings where you can go and people talk about the research that they're currently doing and practice presentations. You know, seize all those opportunities to be there, to be engaged, to be visible, and to soak in sort of all that those opportunities offer, right? So be proactive and be engaged. Um, identify what time and resources you need to be successful, right? And figure out how you're going to provide those to yourself. And providing time to yourself is a challenge, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges that graduate students often face. It's certainly one of the challenges I think that new faculty and even old faculty face. I face it all the time. There's never enough time, right? And so part of assessing where you are and making sure you're successful going forward is thinking about the resources that you are going to need, and time is one of those resources. Sort of figuring out what that looks like. Does it mean you have to get up a little earlier? Does it mean you stay awake a little later? Does it mean you shift the, your priorities around? It'll work differently for everybody. Um, seize opportunities to enhance your professional profile. So think about for a minute, who, who do you see yourself as right now? Right? Just kind of, who do you see yourself as? How would you describe yourself? Right? And then think about how you would want to answer that when you leave with your degree and you start pursuing the career that you're hoping to pursue. Who will that person be? Right? If you're imagining your current self meeting that future self, that you want to become. What would that look like right now? How are you different now than the person that you think you want to become? Right? And I think in looking at that and getting to know yourself where you are now and where you want to be, what the person you want to grow into and become, 
um, will help you sort of figure out how, what you need to do to get there. And I think one of the big areas that's probably a gap between your current self and your future self are the kind of professional experiences that graduate school will provide you, right? Maybe your future self is really well published and out on the academic job market looking for a, your first professorial job. Maybe your future self is looking for you know, an upper level management position in the field that you're studying uh, in your professional master's program. Whatever that is, chances are that it's more than just showing up, taking your classes, getting your transcript, and doing your culminating experience that will help you become that person. It's all those other parts of graduate school, right? that aren't officially on a transcript, but that will differentiate you from everyone else and help turn you into that professional you want to be. So whether it be co-authoring a paper with another graduate student or a faculty member, joining a faculty member's research project, attending conferences in your field, um, doing that internship uh, over winter break and next summer uh, in, the, in the field that you want to be in, it's all those extra opportunities that will help you hone your skills and build your professional re resume and sort of transform yourself to become the professional you want to be. So that's really what you have to ask yourself is who do I want to be right? and how do I get there? And it really will take sweat and it will take sacrifice, but it will also be so much fun because hopefully you're picking something that you love and you're passionate about and that you're excited about and how cool would it be to be the person who's great at that. Right? And so never forget what drove you to do this in the first place. You're going to need to draw on that passion, that energy, that excitement. But at the same time, recognize that it's not easy for anybody. When you have those moments where you know, it feels like a lot of sacrifice, or you're really, you know, you're really exhausted, or you're really pushing yourself, you have to know that you're not alone in that. Right? And you're, it's not a bad thing, and it's not, it shouldn't be a scary thing. It's a part of the process. But at the same time, hopefully, you feel lots of joy along the way, and you find your moments to to enjoy the fact that you're pursuing what you really want to pursue. Your network. So it's not just about you. You can do all of those things, but it probably won't help you get down the road to success where you want to be if you're traveling it alone. You need to travel that road to success with a team, right? And you need to find your team. Some of you may already know your team, right? You might have come here to your grad program because you know a faculty member or two, or because you know some more senior grad students. Perhaps you were an undergraduate here and you've, you're already in somebody's research lab, but maybe not. Maybe you're totally new and you're trying to still find your team. So you have to find your people. And this is the semester where this is, should be pretty high on your to-do list. Um, and by finding your people, I mean the faculty who are doing the work that you want to do, right? The, the faculty mentors who share your perspective, right? Who have some commonalities with you and who would be good at supporting you and helping you achieve your goals. Right? The other graduate students in your current cohort, the new students, but also the more senior students. They have a lot to offer you because they've been where you are very recently and they know how to navigate both where you are and what's coming ahead for you in your program. So those are great resources and they're probably pretty great people. And keep in mind that this network of graduate students, um, mentors, faculty, folks around campus, even outside your office, people or your department, People often find great colleagues and mentors and professional friends. Um, those people are your network, not just for graduate school, but then they become the foundation of your network when you graduate and move on, right? And so you're building this sort of um, uh, social structure, right, around yourself and your goals that will help you be more successful and it will build these relationships that you'll be able to draw on, not just in grad school, but for many years to come, right? At the same time, you'll have the opportunity to give back Right? to be that mentor to next year's new grad students, to uh, help other people on their path. And in doing so, you're likely to help yourself. So being a good mentee means not just finding the right mentor, but living up to your mentor's expectations. Right, Understanding that a mentor-mentee relationship is a give and take, and it really requires commitment and, and dedication and hard work on both sides. Right, As the mentee, you don't just absorb all the benefits of working with a faculty mentor and get all the good things that your mentor gives you without giving anything back, right? It really is a two-way street where you and your mentor, you know, sort of do research together, potentially publish together, um, that you really become helpful to one another in different ways. So you have to look for the right mentor, but also make sure you're being a good mentee. And as you move through your career, probably you'll have the chance to turn around and mentor someone else and they'll be a good mentee to you. So, but one of the other things I wanted to say about your network is um, many times over the years, I've come across situations where 
you're working with a lot of people on this campus, in your department, in your lab, whatever, and not everybody likes each other all the time. Right? Don't let it throw you off. It's just like the big world out there. Right? You're going to find people that you just adore, that you, you know, connect with, and it's wonderful to work with them, and you're going to find people that are different from you, and you just kind of rub each other the wrong way. That's inevitable. Right? Now, we hope it doesn't happen, but the reality is the world is a big and complex place, and that sometimes happens. Right? When it happens, I want to encourage you to remember the difference between two words that sound similar but mean very different things. Congeniality and collegiality. Right? Congeniality is being cheerful and nice and friendly, and it's great if you feel congenial towards someone and you feel like being, you know, Miss Congeniality, right? Outgoing, friendly, all of those things. But it's not required. What is required on campus and in your professional relationships at all times is collegiality. You know what collegiality is? Colleague. Yes, to be a colleague. What does it mean to be a good colleague? To be professional. Professional friend. Yes, professional, professional friend, respectful, right? To treat others with kindness, right? It's different than being best friends. It's different than feeling like you have to always be congenial. Sometimes you're just having a bad day and you don't feel like being congenial, but you must always be collegial, right? And if you have a right to expect others to be collegial to you. And that's a really, I think, important dynamic that becomes more clear in places like graduate school and the workplace when you start your profession. So you're creating an academic family, and by building this network around you, you're creating your sort of academic family tree that stays with you as you move forward. All right, so starting to wrap up. All of this is really important, working on yourself, working on your social and academic network. But all of that happens in the broader context of a campus and the social structures that you work in, your department, your university, the graduate school. And in that context, there are resources. And it's for you to identify the resources that are available and to match them to your needs. Go back to that first slide about you, right? Uh, figure out which of these workshops, for example, help you move forward in the places where you might uh, have some weaknesses or some challenges. Figure out what activities, uh, what um, offices on campus provide things that would be useful to you. Because you can't do it with just you and your network. You need to capitalize on the resources that the university offers you. And they offer you a lot. You don't need every one of them. But you probably need a whole bunch of them. And students who recognize that and see the opportunity to take advantage of these resources make it further along their road to success faster and easier. Right? These are just things that help you move forward. So everything from the health and rec centers to um, student counseling center, the writing center, online education to help you with your online classes or to develop them if you'll be teaching them. Of course, the library, an abundance of resources here in terms of both people and you know, access to materials and information, the graduate commons. There are many, many, many. We went over many of those at orientation. right? Uh, and your department, your mentor, the graduate college, we can always connect you to resources. So if you're finding that you have a need that isn't being met, start asking. The other grad students in your network can help you. Your department can help you. We in the grad college can help you. Because you need the resources to be successful. One of the most important resources I want to draw your attention to are finances and financial planning. There is an epidemic of, of graduate student debt in this country. Right? Graduate students take out loans. We don't have subsidized loans anymore for graduate students. Those were eliminated about three years ago by the federal government. So now all loans are unsubsidized. Now not all of you take out loans, but those of you that do, you really need to be proactive to understand how your, um, how your loans accrue, right? how, much, how much your loans are growing each semester and each year, uh, what it takes uh, and when you need to start paying those loans off. Right? So be proactive about staying abreast of that information because it will impact you, not only as a student, but when you leave. And we want you to leave and to walk across that stage of graduation, be so proud of your degree and so excited to go out and, and chase down the career that you're interested in pursuing and to do it without the heavy baggage right, of a lot of debt. And so to the extent that we can help you with that, we're happy to do so. And there are some financial workshops that we offer along those lines. Um, there are graduate assistantships. If you don't have a GA already and you're interested in one in the future, there are often um, um, information about available positions through the Graduate College on our website, through the career services links, you can get information. We have a scholarship and fellowship deadline coming up December 1st. You'll start to get emails about that in the next few weeks. Apply for everything. Submit your FAFSA. By submitting your free FAFSA, it makes you eligible for scholarships that you don't even have to apply for. We have many hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of awards that we give out based on FAFSA submission without you even knowing. 
right? And then it just shows up and people are like, wow, I got an access award, what's that? That's cool, right? Uh, and nobody has ever said no thank you to it, right? So for the 15 minutes it takes to fill out a FAFSA, fill out the FAFSA, it's worth a try, right? So, uh, apply for these online um, scholarships and fellowships, seize the opportunity to get the resources to have you not have to worry uh, as much about finances now and hopefully in the future. And stay in touch. The only way to know what's going on and to seize all these opportunities and use the resources at your disposal is to know what's happening. So follow GPSA, right? Uh, follow the Graduate College. Uh, stay informed about what's happening because we're here to be your support system and part of that network. And that's it. We're here to provide you 100% solutions. If you ever need me or my team, we are always happy to help. That's awesome. about it. Thank you, Dean Corgan. So, um, uh, my name is Takaya Masita. I'm a, uh, believe it or not, I'm fourth year uh, assistant professor in the sociology department. And uh, I was going to say exactly what the Dr. Corgan said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, since she already covered comprehensively, I'd like to give you more like, practical uh, advices slash my opinions. So, um, I just wanted to organize uh, this as a, um, the question according to your handout if you have. Uh, the first one was, uh, what are the key for getting a strong start in my graduate program? Uh, I have a few suggestions. Uh, most of the things that I'm going, I'm going to say is kind of uh, related to uh, Dr. Corgan's uh, presentation. So um, it might be a little bit redundant, but just take it as a reinforcement. Uh, the first thing is the communication with your faculty members and other colleagues. It's important for you to have uh, up-to-date information. Uh, sometimes, uh, even though you imagine this is how it's going to work, it might be different from what you think. So just make sure uh, you're in good communication uh, with all the faculty members. And uh, the next thing, uh, since uh, uh, the semester already started, but um, I would suggest you to read department handbooks and all the uh, university website. Just try to uh, get yourself familiar with all the department policies, university policies, um, how many classes you need to take per semester, so on and so forth. So just make sure you do that kind of reading before the semester, which is already too late, but still you can do that. Um, the third thing I want to say is uh, the graduate study is not just uh, academic life. Um, you come to school, or take classes, do assignment. That's not just a, that's just a part of your uh, graduate studies. It includes over all, uh, all entire life. So um, I would suggest you to take care of the non-academic things before the semester as soon as possible. Uh, if you haven't done it, uh, do that right away. Uh, for example, um, you want to make yourself uh, comfortable at home. If you uh, can't relax at home, um, the graduate study is very stressful, so it's going to be hard for you to kind of keep up with it. And so, you know, if you don't have internet at home, it might be a problem, so just make sure you get all the utilities, housing, and other non-academic stuff uh, taken care of. And also, I mean, just kind of silly, but make sure you can find, you find good like, grocery stores or restaurants. So because it's so busy, you don't have time to cook, or you, you don't want to think about like 30 minutes what to eat for lunch like I do every day. <laughs> <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that in front of a bean. <laughs> um, and also, uh, let's see. Uh, if you have a bad relationship, make sure you break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend. <laughs> because it's going to take up a lot of time. I've seen some grad students going through that kind of crisis and then uh, you know, screw up some of that work. So just make sure you do that. Um, also, uh, I'm kind of a little bit unique person. So when I first came to UNLV, I found 10 different ways to get to the university, right? just in case there was an accident or just in case there was a construction. So uh, I just want you to be like, proactive, like Dr. Hogan said, and uh, just make sure if something happens, this is your backup plan. So always uh, pro be proactive and then get ahead of the game. And let's see. And uh, this is just the common sense, but if you, we all use computers, so make sure your laptop is, has, uh, laptop or desktop computer has no problem. Um, it might be a good time for you to invest before the semester because you, know, 
you don't want to have computer problems during the semester. Okay. Um, the other thing is uh, you always should take care of yourself. Um, health problem is going to uh, 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 delay your uh, work. So just make sure you just eat healthy and you go to you exercise <coughs> and that kind of stuff. Otherwise, um, it's going to be a problem. And I think Dr. Kogan also said that, but uh, I would suggest you to set the goal and the calculate it backwards to achieve this goal. What do you need to do? So if today, if you want to watch Netflix all night, or if you want to watch do the reading, uh, you should know what to do. Okay, so those are the kind of like hopefully practical suggestions. Um, oh, and the final thing is uh, just make sure you know where to go. When you, have, when you need something, when you go to class, make sure you know where the classroom is, uh, make sure you know where the, uh, the graduate college is and uh, where to find uh, whoever you need. Uh, because um, right after I came to the uh, UNLV, the first semester, my very first class, I didn't check where the classroom is and I got lost. And I finally made it two minutes before the class started and this is a sociology course. Okay, and I got into the classroom, and what I found was a cafeteria. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, the room assignment was wrong. So the my class was assigned to the cafeteria. Wow. And but I thought maybe in Las Vegas this is how it works. <laughs> <laughs> but it was not obviously. So I had to make a call in the last minutes, and they finally figured that the room, but. I don't want you to have that kind of experience. So just make sure you know where to go. Uh, the second thing is how can I find the UNLV resources to be a success in graduate school? I think uh, Dr. Kogan already showed you some comprehensive list. Um, I would suggest you to use the technology. You don't have to do everything manual. Um, one of the examples is uh, when you're writing paper, for example, uh, it usually takes a lot of time to put the reference list together. But there are lots of good computer software available, so I would suggest to use that. That's going to save a lot of time. Especially when you're writing thesis or dissertation, you have to cite like 200, 250 citations. You don't want to type everything. Just make sure you have a good database and then uh, use those in your work right away using the technology. Can you name one? Uh, I like. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about Yeah, oh, okay, my bad. I mean, she's going to talk about it. The UNLV has a RefWorks software, but I prefer, I usually use uh, the EndNote. Uh, you have, you're going to have to buy it, but I think it's really, it either way works. Um, let's see. And there's the Writing Center, Library, and the Rec Center. Those are the all resources you have. So like I said, it's not just about studying. It's not just about being academic, but uh, it involves entire life. So just make sure you take care of the non-academic part as well. And how do I select my committee? Um, it's got to be based on your research interests. So just because he looks good or she looks good, don't pick the committee chair. Uh, just make sure uh, you kind of talk to them in advance and see if their research expertise uh, matches yours and as well as uh, your work style. And I like doing things very systematically, so I set the deadline if my student doesn't uh, meet those deadlines without telling me, uh, you know, it's kind of like a bad thing. And guess who's writing a recommendation letter in a couple of years, right? <laughs> so just make sure your um, that work style and the research expertise matches your uh, committees. Uh, I think it's really important. It's not just about like how much uh, research skills you have, uh, how knowledgeable you are, uh, your like, work ethics, um, being on time, being professional, those are all important uh, throughout your graduate studies. Let's see. So, uh, in short, um, you just have to prove yourself to your committee members so that you get good recommendation letters as well. Uh, let's see. What should I expect from myself, my community, and my department? Um, the one thing I just want to emphasize is that you should have initiative. you got to make things happen. Nobody is going to come to you, hey, you have to read this, you have to do this to, in order to get your job. No, you're just going to have to set your own goal and then figure out what to do. And all the faculty members, staff members are there to help you, but they're not going to hold your hand and guide you to your goal. So just make sure 
it's very different from undergrad program. They don't tell you what to do. You're going to decide what to do. Okay. And also, you got to be a little bit tougher than when you were uh, undergrad students because you face a lot of criticism, rejections, and uh, all kinds of bad things. But you're going to have to uh, get them over. And the last thing I wanted to say is uh, stay always positive and uh, remind yourself why you are here. Right? Sometimes you just have to do lots of assignments, you have to write a lot of papers, too much reading, uh, you kind of get lost. But just always remind yourself why you are here. And you gotta be, you gotta stay positive because you can't change the assignment, right? If a professor tells you, hey, you have to do this by next week, you're gonna do it anyway. So instead of being negative, complaining, just be positive. You gotta, you can't change the world. So just do what you gotta do. And I always used to just tell my uh, colleagues that I have a day every Friday night with the beta. So, <laughs> yeah. so um, just use a sense of humor and stay positive. That would be my uh, suggestion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Yamashita. So we'll uh, hand it over to Kate Wintrell now out of the libraries. And I will say, uh, we, we, we'll have some questions that will uh, that no doubt are already in your minds. Uh, so we will have uh, plenty of time for panel discussion as well after each of our four uh, speakers present too. How was your first two weeks? Not too bad, what you expected? Now, have you all seen all of the library? Have you been up to the fifth floor? All right, need to go to the fifth floor, the best views on campus. And it has some really nice chairs. Uh, if you need just some time to chill out, to relax, to get away from everything, it gives you a little space. So check the fifth floor over in the corner, great big, huge windows, best view on campus. Second thing I have to ask you, have you had your Rebel card activated? Everybody. Everybody in the library. I mean, go downstairs. Did you get your PIN number? Mm -hmm. Everything. Okay. Because if you know if you're going to do any research from home, uh, you don't use your ACE account. You're going to have to use your library account, which is the back side of your card. So that's an important part to do. The other thing I wanted to tell you is that we have all kinds of resources and people that can really help you in your graduate career. And myself, I'm a good example of this because I had been a reporter and a photographer for a long time. And I decided to make a dramatic uh, change, and so I came to UNLV to study classical history, ancient history. So how's that for a change? Um, and although I thought I knew a lot about research, I didn't know anything about academic research. And once I got into the, uh, into the field, I was kind of lost. I couldn't find the right things. I knew they were out there somewhere, but it's kind of like a maze. You know, you're a hamster trying to find the cheese going through the maze, you know, and, and I knew somewhere all these things were there. So I ended up talking to the librarians at the research desk, and I became, you know, friends with some of them and went back through them all through my career, and they really helped me. If it hadn't been for them, I might have been really lost. So then I got a degree in library science, so that's how the whole thing ends up. So we really do have a lot of sources. So I just wanted to show you um, from the library's website, you want to go to services. Probably easier just to show you these things. Services, see, for graduate students. All right, so here we go. First thing I wanted to talk about is um, that it's really important to get an interlibrary loan account right here. Has anybody done that yet? Oh, very important. Okay. So, so we have two things. We have interlibrary loan, too, and then we have document delivery. When you research, you're going to find that there are journal articles that we do not have the full text to. You only get the citation or the abstract. But it's very easy to get the full text of a journal article or a book, perhaps, that we don't have, or a conference proceeding, a book chapter. You just need to create an interlibrary loan account. And while you're actually, while you're searching, you know, if we don't have the text, you can just click one of the lines from our search box and say, put it in my, you know, put a request in my Iliad account, and they fill it all out for you while you're doing your searching. So if you create this account, you keep it open while you're on your, you know, doing all of your searching. Something you want, we don't have, you just press that, you know, request to PDF, and then it'll fill this all out for you. So it's very important. Create a, a Iliad account. It really um, helps because Sad to say, we don't have everything, although we have a lot of things. Um, the other thing is document delivery. 
And what that will do, same thing, you sign up for the account, but that's going to make copies for you of things that we do own so that maybe you don't have to print it out. And you can have a copy in PDF you can put in a file for you. And they'll send these things to your, uh, your email. They'll let you know that they're there and send you there. So I think pretty important. One little thing, too, is Link Plus. Have any of you heard of Link Plus down here? That's for books. So say you're searching in the book catalog and there's just what you wanted, but it's missing. I love the missing. Paid and missing. Oh, boy. Um, you know, uh, checked out for a year, something like that. You just would do the Link Plus. And Link Plus is very easy, too. You don't really have to create an account or anything. You're just going to do a search, request the book. It'll ask you for your barcode, your PIN number, and you know where you want the book delivered. And it'll be here in three to five days. So it's a very good source instead of panicking if they don't have the book. Often it's a way to find textbooks, too, and other books that are required. You can borrow them from Link Plus or from Iliad, um, a way to save a little money, too. Uh, let's go back to one other thing that we were talking about, RefWorks Citation Manager. And here we've got our Ref RefWorks page. Um, and particularly, like you were saying, if you have a nice long thesis to do, you're going to want to have a RefWorks account. And again, like, uh, some, like Iliad, when you are searching, you can you find something you want, you can download it to RefWorks. And it will take that citation and just put it in your, your folders or your account once you have it. So it makes it very easy. And we have, um, like here you would just do the login, create your own account. But if you scroll down a little bit, there are some instructions, quick work guide, and then there's some tutorials. There's a little bit of a learning curve. If you're using our database, it's no problem. If you're using a website uh, from Italy, you may have a few issues here and there. But we can help you with that. We also have tutorials just on RefWorks. We had one, I think, yesterday. So those are a few things that I wanted to talk to you about. The other one that's really important are the people. And we actually have um, subject librarians for all of your field. If you're in business, we have a business librarian. If you're in history, literature, we have someone who does that. So we have different fields, hospitality, all the sciences are covered. Um, so we have different, and they're really good at helping you do that, uh, that deep search. Uh, because again, I'm always surprised. I just helped a couple students, graduate students, yesterday, and I didn't even know uh, something existed, you know, one of our, and I found out how it worked and how it existed and what was in there, and it was like, really? You know? So we have like over 300 uh, databases, too. So the other thing I would tell you uh, to do is to uh, make an appointment. You can make an appointment with the librarian, and that you can make your own personal appointment, but you can also go down a little farther, and you can schedule librarian by subject. So if you wanted to find out who was yours, you could find out. There I am in art. Uh, but I have some other ones too. So here's all, and then you can make an appointment with them if you want to, or just call them and say, hey, can I stop by to talk? And I have to tell you, you know, helping students is really the best part of all of our days. Uh, and it is a lot better than being dragged to a meeting, right? <laughs> Any of you who go to meetings, you know what I'm talking about. So I just wanted to kind of remind you of all these things that are out there. Um, and when then we do have all these workshops. Besides RefWorks, we have one on on um, critical reading. We have some on some really interesting ones on how to apply for grant money. So look up our uh, workshops. I think those are, I don't know where that is. I think back. Uh, workshops, yeah, faculty workshops and institutes. So we have all of these different ones. So you can look up, these are different ones, and you can look up all of our different workshops that we have. I think you all and on that. So um, we're all willing, you know, we're ready, we're here. We really like to help students. Uh, it's so much fun, too, to find out what people are studying. And, and a lot of times I'm an, an honors librarian, so I've helped students all the way through their honors career, all the way up to going to graduate school. And as you watch them do their final, you know, presentation, it's wonderful. Present thesis, it's great, great experience. So um, it's interesting for us, too. And we're here to help you. So good luck and uh, have a wonderful time in graduate school. Thank you, Kate. So now we'll turn it over to Sheila, who is, uh, what, what year are you in grad school? Just second year. Second year. Yeah. So, so you were, she, she was in your shoes, yes. many of your shoes, as, uh, with a lot of first year grad students here, uh, just a year ago. Mm -hmm. You remember that time? I try not to. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm in a better place. Um, hi, I'm Sheila, and I work in Dr. Raftery's lab. I'm in the School of Life Sciences Department. And like he just said, I was in your shoes a year ago, so I know what you're feeling, your emotions, what 
the overwhelmingness that you're feeling right now and experiencing. So I moved here from California. That's another thing that you have to experience is the move. So if you're from some from out of state or just coming from another country, you're going to be overwhelmed as well. So it's a combination of everything. And going from undergrad and <coughs> graduate school is very different because going from undergrad, from high school to undergrad, you're experiencing a lot of excitement and anxiousness you're going to live on your own for the first time in your life and it's very exciting and you have a huge group of people that you're going to experience it with there's a new class coming in and there everyone's there's a new group of freshmen coming into grad school is a little different because it's a smaller group so there's less people experiencing what you're going through um, each department has only a, um, f is, has fewer incoming students and you could be one of a few people going into your new labs. So in a way, you're kind of like the new kid in school. You're going into a lab or an environment where everyone around you has already gone through what you're going through. They're a lot more experienced, so it's very intimidating. For me, it was very intimidating. I don't know how you guys feel about it so far. But don't panic because you're going to... It takes time. It takes time. There's... Um, there's, they're there to help you. So they were talk. Everyone has been talking about resources that you can turn to when you feel overwhelmed. This is the first resource that you guys are using, the GPSA. They offer workshops like this um, for many different topics. Then you have your advisor or your mentor. Um, it could be the same person. They have the answers that you need suitable for your lab specifically or your department. So make sure you talk to them a lot and you have an open communication with them. And your, the, your advisors will get really busy sometimes. So when that happens, that's when you can turn to your colleagues or the people in your labs or the people around you or the older grad students because they know exactly what you're going through, they know what to do, and they have all the answers to your questions. And they have the ones suitable specifically to your different departments, because different departments require different stuff. And they're going to be one of your closest friends because you're with them all the time. And they're going to help you, help introduce you to different people, help you network, and that's the way that you're going to progress and succeed in grad school, is communicating with everyone else. Um, so a couple things that you should do in grad school is, like you guys said, stay informed. The more informed you are, the less room there is for any surprises in the end. So keep an open communication with your advisor. Tell them your expectations for them, and they should tell you their expectations for you. And this way you are constantly communicating. There's no surprises. Um, be informed about any um, activities, seminars, social events that there are, and the more you go do, the more networking you can get. And be self-sufficient. In undergrad, um, you have people telling you what to do and helping you out, and there's a lot of hand-holding. In grad school, no one's going to tell you or be behind you saying, okay, do this, do this. So you're going to need to make sure you know how to time manage you need time management skills so that you can make sure that you're not overwhelmed in the end. And um, don't panic. No one's born going into grad school and being ready for everything. No one's born a researcher. So just take it one step at a time and know that if you keep up with your research, you communicate with people, you're going to get there and you're going to be um, further on in your graduate career progressing consistently each year. And um, undergrad and grad school are a little different because undergrad, a lot of people are more competitive because you need to get good grades, you need to be at the top of the class in order to go to a good professional school. Grad school is a little different. There's l less competition in that you want to collaborate with people. You want to communicate with people. You want to communicate your research. So it's not keeping secrets, you're not being um, to yourself or trying to be above everyone else. You're trying to work with everyone because the more you work with them, the more willing they will be to help you whenever you need help as well. 
and it's different. The your focus shifts from undergrad when you're focusing on your courses because you need to get good grades and in order to get into a good graduate program they're going to look at your transcripts. Whereas in graduate school, after graduate school when you earn your master's or your PhD, whatever degree you want, they're not going to focus on your grades that you receive. They're not going to look at your transcripts. They're going to look at your research and they're going to see your publications and that's what they're going to focus on. So you're going to, at this point, shift your focus, still continue to do well in your classes, but also try to focus a lot on your research and read all the papers that you need to and look for the papers because um, a big part of grad school is you're being self-sufficient. So make sure you keep up with everything and keep up with the up-to-date research and that's going to help you progress too. And um, I guess my last thing is I have, I wrote a blog. My lab has a blog. So this is it. It's on my lab website and it's called Surviving Your First Year of Grad School. It's, um, it's a little less formal so if you want to read it on your own time that's fine. If you go into Google and just type in Surviving the First Year of Grad School Raftery Lab, it's gonna it's gonna be the first link, so you can just look into that, and um, that's pretty much it. Just don't panic, don't freak out. If you're overwhelmed, do something. Take one day off. There's a lot of hiking, as you have may, <laughs> may have heard already. I heard it so many times my first year, but it really is beautiful. So just if you're overwhelmed, take a day off and try to relax, and then go back to working and everything. Thank you. So now I'd ask if our four panelists could take up front, and then uh, we've got, again, plenty of time for any questions you may have. It's a great opportunity to ask our panelists anything that comes to mind. Hi, and if you don't ask anything, that means you already know everything, and <laughs> you get your degrees when you walk out the door today. <laughs> So when do you start your research? Like, I'm understanding about like doing this, these publications, and yeah. I'm getting my master's in social work, and I, I, I have a research paper, mm -hmm. but I'm just trying to understand like, do we need to be published, or, I mean, how much, how important is that? In order. It depends on your field. You know, yeah, I mean, because yeah, I'm sitting here, true. and I. I know everybody has a different field, but I'm just trying to sit here and I'm like, wait a minute, I have absolutely no idea about publicating anything yet. So, so I mentioned um, the diff I mentioned two examples. You know, somebody pursuing a doctorate and somebody pursuing a professional master's. Right, a social work is more of a professional master's, mm -hmm. uh, and so you're you're on a slightly different path. How many of you are in doc programs? Okay, about half, and the rest in master's programs. A few more masters. All right, so um, slightly different, but not completely separate paths, right? So masters, depending on your field, many masters are sort of professional masters, where the idea is you get all of this expertise, right, and then you go out and you work in your field, right? Yeah. But you enter at a much higher place yeah. than if you had an undergraduate degree, right? Yeah. And so um, pr probably you're going to be mo more focused on understanding cutting-edge research that other people are doing learning how to ask research questions, right? But maybe not so much pressure to do your own publishing yeah, because, uh, in a master's program. I mean, they're asking us, you know, you should try to do more volunteering. I'm like, well, that makes more sense. Yes, so, right. Internships, yes. uh, you know, those kinds of things to help you. But it varies by department. There are other master's programs that where there's a thesis requirement at the end. Any of you in those? Okay, those, by, by virtue of the fact that they have a thesis, it means they expect you to do research. So for you, it's a slightly different answer. You probably should be starting now to think about, you know, make sure you have the research method skills that you need and what your research questions are and all the tools that are available to you through the library to be successful in that way. I already started. There you go. Good. Good. <laughs> Two different courses required. Perfect. So it'll, it'll vary. All right. Just like, whoop, <laughs> Sounds like you're just fine. Yeah. So I would like to know, um, my program, um, they didn't have any GAs available at all. Uh, What's your program? Hospitality. And um, 
so I was concerned about getting up, getting that and how I can do that. So the, uh, for everyone in the room, the first and best place to look for GA is in your department, right? And to talk to them if they're going to have positions in the future. Uh, very often faculty write grants or have contracts. And then on those grants and contracts, they can fund graduate assistance. So there's two different sort of types of GA funding. One is called state funding, and it's you know positions that the grad college gives your dean, gives your department, who, and then they hire you. And then there are positions that are funded by faculty who have their research funds uh, through grants or contracts. So even if your department doesn't have a state line for you, there might be faculty who are doing research or who have contracts with um, you know colleagues in the hospitality and casino industry uh, that might be able to fund you on GA. So that's always the first place to start. Beyond that, if you don't have any luck, um, we post available GA positions that we know about on our website. Um, and it's the Grad Rebel Success Center. So if you go to um, Current Students and then Grad Rebel Success Center, there's a careers link there. And then UNLV Career Services, same thing. They can post it there. So you can look for other sort of units on campus, like the Graduate College or Financial Aid or um, the Academic Success Center. You know, many, many places around campus hire GAs. And that's where you can find out about those. Also, I would suggest you to look for not just a big scholarship or assistantship. There are lots of small like the travel fund or paper award with cash award, cash, you know, cash award. So those small things, just whenever you come across any opportunity, just keep applying for it. Sometimes it's going to add up and uh, you know, help you a lot. Um, is it okay to make an appointment with your um, area-specific librarian mm -hmm. regarding a specific assignment? Sure, of okay. course. We all do. That's what they do all the time. Okay. In fact, sometimes we work with the faculty to help work on the assignments uh, and what kind of sources they would want and, and what are the requirements for it, and then we help them sometimes to design the assignment. So, yeah, no, that would be exactly what we do work on. And then overall, you know, overall, you know, kind of research, brainstorming, and uh, topic narrowing. We do some of that too. But usually it's about specific assignments. And actually, I'm still in the undergraduate student, um, but I was hoping to get some information, which I am. Uh, so thank you. But one of my questions about selecting committee and looking at who would I go to to be an advisor or a mentor, uh, what can, uh, how would that look? apply to everyone in the room, but to really select the right people for the committee or seeking people um, who, you know, certainly have a busy schedule. How do you convince them uh, to, to commit their time to that? Do you want to start? Go ahead. Um, for when I was choosing my committee, a lot of it was from my advisor because she knows um, who all the faculty are. She knows their personalities, what they work on. And for me, it was based on my research and my project. Mm -hmm. And it was everyone that was more um, closer to the area of research that I'm doing for my project. So they would be able to help me out if I needed to ask them something about it. And then you have one committee member that's from outside of your department. And that um, is just based on um, who your advisor would find most helpful in that. So mine is from statistics. So if I have information or data that I need, I can ask her about that for anything that I wouldn't know about since I'm in cell and molecular. And so how to find that first advisor or mentor who can help you find the rest of the committee? Because yeah. you're right, that's, <laughs> that's a great way to get the rest of the committee. But you sometimes need to figure out who that first person is, right? Your, your main mentor. Um, I do I think about a couple of things. You have to obviously pick someone who's doing research or who has expertise in the kinds of things you want to study, right? So if you want to write a thesis about trees, don't go and ask the person who specializes in bugs, right? <laughs> pick the person who specializes in trees. Um, and maybe more specifically, if you want to study spruce, go to the spruce person if there is one, not the elm person, right? So you start by first matching interests and expertise, right? But that's not always the best place to stop. Um, you then have to make sure you can work together. So it has to be somebody that you like enough and you can trust and respect because if, they're, if you're going to let them mentor you, 
you really have to sort of be willing to take their advice. You have to be willing to, you know, sort of respect their opinion on things, right? And so you want to find someone where you feel like you can have that rapport, and vice versa. <laughs> you said something really important. How do you make? How do you convince them to take you on, right? And that goes back to being a good mentee. You need to go in and, and understand upfront this is an exchange, just like all relationships. Doesn't matter if it's an intimate relationship and you're talking about boyfriend, girlfriend, spouses, partners, whatever, you know, it's a give and take, right? You both support each other and do things for each other and you both get things out of the relationship. Same with parents and kids, you know, all relationships. And that's the same with mentor and mentee. So your mentor has to meet you and say, this person is somebody I like, I trust, I believe is hardworking, I believe will add something to my professional world, right? Um, and that when I give them advice or try to guide, they'll respond and, and they'll show up and do things when they say that they'll show up and do things, right? You need to be a good mentee. So um, I think it's a combination of those things. Awesome. One more comment, sorry. So the way that I chose is based on what I did in my lab for undergrad. And I emailed my current advisor, and I was in California, so I didn't. I emailed her, and we talked a little. And I wanted to meet her in person because people may be different if you're talking to them through email than in person. So I visited the lab, and something you can do is talk to the lab members because if anyone knows them, the advisor better than anyone, it would be the lab members, and they know how the personality is and if they can work with them. So that would be your best resources, ask the lab members and how they work with the advisor. Let me uh, just respond to two quick things. One is that when they ask you what your research interest is, you should be able to answer within uh, 30 seconds and 2 minutes and 5 minutes worth. So uh, sometimes you don't have to tell so much details, but you should be able to articulate what your research interest is. Then that would help your advisor or everyone else to kind of match you and the appropriate advisor. The other thing is uh, the choosing advisor is critical because um, you don't have so much time in your hand. So sometimes you're going to have to combine class project, GA work, teaching responsibility, and your own project all in one together. So if you pick one good uh, advisor committee chair, uh, maybe she or he would let you just do research projects related related to your class project, as well as GA work. So you can just kill three birds with one stone. So, you know, so that's why it, it's important for you to be able to articulate what your research interest is, so that you can pick the right person, and that will lead to your success. That's an excellent point, and I just, not, not to uh, emphasize it again, but hey, Rebel Grad Slam! So I think, I think you heard about that at the beginning. The whole point of the Rebel Grad Slam is grad students come together and have three minutes and three slides to talk about who they are, what they study, why they study it, how they study it, what you're finding, why it matters. Boom. That's what, that's what, you know, that's your elevator speech. A 30 second version of two, a two or three minute and a five minute. And so Rebel Grad Slam is a great event to practice those skills. So you should participate if you can. If you can't, you should certainly attend and be around this year because you'll learn a lot and then plan to do it next year. Um, so I have an advisor, and I saw her, and I spoke to her, and I told her this is what I want to do is a direct practice. And then she, in turn, says, "I don't do direct practice. You have to see this person." And I'm already making those. I'm, I've already like went in. I tried knocking on her door. She wasn't there, so I sent her an email. I was wondering, is there any possible way you can switch advisors, or? No. It depends on your department. So if you're assigned an advisor, yeah. is that the case? Um, so I would talk to the graduate coordinator okay. or the chair and okay. see if there's a possibility of a switch. Okay. They won't want to switch you if you've been assigned to someone who does what you want to do. No, if it's she, a bad match, yeah. they would probably be very happy to switch you yeah. um, and can help facilitate that. So she does management and I want to do direct practice and she's like, I can't help you at all with what you want to do. The person who you need to speak to is the chairperson? I'm like, okay, great. So, so I was so just grad coordinator is always a good person to talk to your chair in the department. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Sort of a, as a follow up to that, what, what are some other um, bits of advice you'd offer as far as committee membership goes? Should you look for everything out of one member? Should you try to balance what different committee members bring as far as their respective strengths? I don't know. Any any other thoughts? But also, I think a good question about can you switch? 
uh, I've, I've known plenty of grad students who thought they wanted to do something on day one, and then by day 181, their interests had shifted. Mm -hmm. And then they shifted it again, and then they shifted, so, you know, so you're, you may find yourself in similar positions. So any other thoughts you guys would, would offer in that vein? I guess just that in the, we want your committee to be not all different, completely different personalities, but not all the same personality, because if you can't, if you have different ideas on something and you can't get along with one person, you want to have someone else to be able to talk to and try to get them to speak to the rest of the committee and convince them of something. This may be later on in your research or anything, but you want um, people who are understanding and um, different personalities, so you don't want everyone to be exactly the same. One thing I can share is uh, just don't be afraid of making mistakes. You pick the person who thought was right. Uh, it's just the same as all the relationships, right? So you're going to have to break up and move on to the next. <laughs> <laughs> There's a theme going on. <laughs> I don't mean to emphasize that. <laughs> But we make it easy. We have a little form to make you, you know, the breakup easier because it takes some of the drama away. It's just like a bureaucratic form, a piece of paper. Oh, I need to switch committee members. Could you sign here, please? Simple, right? So there's a form, and and you know, I think the form sort of signals that it's a normal process, right? Uh, it's not just some big emotional thing. So yeah, switch your committee. Make sure you have the best, most balanced committee that provides. And the balance can be both scholarly balance, so you've got your statistician, and then you've got your theorist, or whatever it is, right? So academic skills, but then also personalities, right? You want the person who's going to maybe support you and be understanding, and you want the person who's going to hold you to that deadline, and maybe that's the same person, but maybe not, right? So you want to look for multiple different levels, right, of what people bring to the committee and to the table and to your process. So I understand that we need like a form for selecting our committee and things like that. Are there any forms right now immediately that we need to be aware of? What? You didn't submit it already? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's just kind of form that everything's a little murky, so yeah. Yeah. anything we should be aware of coming up. Check with your departments, because some departments have their own things or do their own things. From the graduate college perspective, you're actually not late on anything yet. Uh, you do want to appoint your committee if you're in a program where you need a committee, right? And there's a committee appointment form. Uh, all of our forms are on the website. If you go to our homepage, there's a little link that says forms, and you click it, and then <laughs> A through Z, every form and the directions for it. So it's pretty user friendly. Um, at the moment, you still have to print them and do real signatures. Maybe, depending on how long you're around, that'll change while you're here and it will be electronic, uh, but you're not late yet. I would say um, if you're in engineering, any engineers? Okay, so disregard what I'm about to say. Everybody else in the room, you can go on my UNLV and look at your degree audit, and if you haven't done that yet, I'd encourage you to do so, because your degree audit in my UNLV will tell you what you need to do, right? Um, and so, Engineering is, we're in the process, it's a new thing, and engineering is the last college that's rolling out like this month. I was going to so say, you, I think I tried that, but I didn't see any. Yeah, yeah, you'll have it soon, right? It'll be coming. Um, and so there's degree audit will, you know, sort of tell you what you need to do and when you need to do it, and you can keep an eye on that. Right? There is something called the DAC form, Degree Audit Companion form, and at some point um, you'll print out your degree audit and you'll put it with this DAC, the Degree Audit Companion form, and have it fill, and fill it out. And basically that's saying to you and your department signs it, they're saying they agree with this, you're telling us, this is my degree program. Because almost every degree program has required courses and then has electives, right? And so at some point you need to know, what's your plan? What are you taking when, you know, and, and what will constitute your degree? And so it's really important that you do that. Some departments will want you to do that this semester. So that you know and we know and everybody knows this is exactly the path you're going to follow to graduation, right? Other departments don't force you to do that, but I really, really, really encourage you to do it if you're in a master's program by the end of this year and in a doc program, which is longer, certainly next year. Um, just so, and again, it's changeable. We don't hold you to it, but once you put that in, it means that sort of you know your path. Your your department signs off, which is really big because they can't come back and change requirements, right? Uh, and we know in the grad college so that we can um, 
be more specific in your degree audits when we know exactly what your path is. When I went on my the my my UNLV side, I didn't find the degree audit thing at all. Where is it located at? Because I looked everywhere. I've never done it from a student's perspective. I, I, honestly, you've stumped me. Um, um, the best I can offer is you can come into my office and we can find it, but I can't tell you off the top of my head. Does okay. Somebody yeah. know off the top of their head? Uh, I just can't tell. <laughs> I don't want a student page where to tell you. Um, to look. We can look. Yeah. Okay, knows. sure. Yeah. And then the other thing. Um, sorry. No, that was a question I should have said later, but um, the other thing I wanted to ask is, will our professors or our classrooms let you know, hey, you have a committee you have to do, or will, I mean, when will we know when we have to do a committee? What, is that, does that show up on the audit? Nope. Or? You need to look at the handbook okay. for your department okay. and the graduate catalog, okay. which is online, it's electronic, go to our website, it says grad catalog, click it. Okay. Make sure you're at the current catalog, because we have archived catalogs there too and you go to your own program. And in the catalog, it'll say exactly what your requirements are based on which subplan you're in or which plan you're in, right? So, so we have different approved tracks and different degrees. So you find yours and it'll talk about what's required and what your culminating experience is. Okay. And, the same, and then you'll want to look at the handbook as well. So you heard that earlier, I'd reiterate that. If you haven't done it, it's critical. Because right now, the only way for you to earn your degree is to do what the catalog says this month. Right? So the catalog that you come in under has the rules and guidelines for what we require you to do to earn your degree. And if you don't do it, there's no degree. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's now is a good time to make okay. sure you stay on track. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a more question about like kind of how to find like a committee member. So I'm a uh, doctor student first year, so I know that I have to submit program of study by the end of this academic year, not this semester. So I know, you know, I'm going to pick four people. I guess I'm not going to pick you know, more than four people. Then I'm going to, you know, select obviously my advisor as one of my committee member. Then I have, you know, one more person who I'm going to probably, you know, select you know, based on my research interest. So I have to find two more people from maybe like one outside, one from maybe same department. Then, so I think you mentioned that you ask your advisor to yeah. find the person because I don't know what the best way to find is because if thinking about proactively, I think I should find someone from, you know, outside by myself. But I think it's nice to ask, you know, my advisor mm -hmm. to see who she thinks the best person. But if, what, you know, what if that person doesn't fit to sort of point like, like my work style? I can't say no to her. If she selected. So what's that? Do you have some like more story about the you know, who did what and the what was great or who did this didn't work, work out for? So if you don't agree with your advisor with someone that they, cho they choose for your committee, I would ask for a list of people that they would suggest and then you could go meet with them and you choose on your own. So at least if you have a list, you know that that's a dependable list, that your advisor knows their personalities, what their research is. They've worked with them longer than we've been here, um, you and me. So they would know. So just ask for a list, and then you can go meet with them and see if you like them, and then you can choose three from the list. That's what I would do. I would just add one other point. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Um, I would just clarify that when you pick a graduate advisory committee, if you need a committee, you need a chair from your own department who has full graduate faculty status. If you're not sure, on our website there's a link and you can look at the spreadsheet. They have to have full graduate faculty status to be a chair of your committee. Okay? Then you need two more people minimum from your department, from your program, that have either associate or full graduate faculty status. It can be either. So it's a little bit more leeway for those roles. Your fourth person is outside your department. The person cannot have any grad faculty status in your department. No close professional ties to your department. We want somebody who's an out objective outsider. And that fourth person needs to be a full graduate faculty member. So again, you'll want to look at that spreadsheet and be sure. Sometimes you'll like meet people or an advisor will recommend someone not realizing that they don't have full graduate faculty status. We can't be on, your, on that fourth person on your committee. That fourth person is called your graduate college. Excuse me, your graduate college representative. 
Uh, and basically, they're representing us and the campus's interests, the sort of rules and regulations and policies and procedures to make sure that everything is done fairly and appropriately, right? So it's great if that person has academic expertise or something to contribute to the substance, but it's not required, right? So that fourth person doesn't have to have, you know, scholarly expertise um, to serve in that role. My advice would be, uh, if you trust your advisor, even though you don't like this person, just take it. Yeah. <laughs> or, That's good advice. Yeah. Or yeah. Uh, just be a man and say no. <laughs> it's your decision. Yeah. You pick your committee, not your advisor. The fourth person in regards to ma'am is, is, they have to be from this university. Uh, yes. Full graduate faculty status means they have to be full time, tenure track or tenure to graduate faculty at this institution. If you want to add someone as an extra committee member from outside this institution who would qualify, you, you have to have your department approve it, and your department can nominate that person for what's called associate graduate faculty status. So it means that a faculty member somewhere else has the appropriate expertise to get associate graduate faculty status, and then they can serve as an extra committee member for you. I only ask that because my thesis is specialized in there. I'm requiring, asking, I know a professor for now, there you go. Yeah, so that'll work. Just have to have your department uh, appointment. This is not a totally different topic, but um, I got an email that you have to fill out a form to waive health insurance. Yes. So do you think talking to the finances, finances and financial planning is a good idea just to figure out if there are any other like costs that I might not know about? Or? Um, do, there shouldn't be any hidden costs. Whatever's on your bill at this point should be your bill. Uh, but if you have health insurance off campus that is comparable and that meets the requirements, definitely leave out of the campus. Why waste that money? And the deadline's approaching. So right. that's, a, that's a worthwhile use of your time, as is applying for Nevada residency. That's the only other thing I'd mention. If you are not currently coded as a Nevada resident, then you'll pay out of state tuition, which is significant. It's a lot more expensive. If you believe you qualify for in-state tuition, you just submit the paperwork and we'll switch you over. And that'll save you a lot of money. So, yeah. So if it comes up as out of state, but you went to high school here and graduated from a Nevada high school, or you live here, or you, you know, you've been here two years and have a residence here, um, any of those circumstances, submit the change to become a Nevada resident officially. That's about it on finance. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I piggyback on what she said. I do have a charge that I'm kind of puzzled about because it's an undergraduate administrative um, fee. And I don't know why I have that since I'm a graduate. So, I, that one I don't know. You stumped me. Um, I would go over to the cashier's office yeah. and simply ask. Okay. I'll do that. Yeah. But I'd probably walk in and, and have something to show them. Yeah. Um, going off of the residency status. Uh, I have a GA, which I was kind of told sort of dependent on financial need as well. Um, so would it be best to try to get that residency status switched just in case I don't get it, or would that impact me getting it renewed the following uh, year? Where is your GA? Uh, kinesiology. In the department? Yeah. I don't think it would, but it's kind of... It should not. Okay. It should not. Uh, I'd want to know if it did. So okay. I would say submit the house up. Um, yeah. Okay. I, but, I don't think, for, but for the residency status? Yeah, no, residency you shouldn't impact GAs at all. At all. Either one. So you said, what worried me is you said it's tied to your financial status. So. Um, it, yeah, I it thought, really shouldn't I be. That, so I think yeah. there's a miscommunication. That's my okay. best guess. So don't let it hinder you from doing any of the good financial things you would otherwise do. Your FAFSA, if you qualify for Nevada residency, by all means submit your Nevada residency. Okay. I think only good things can come from doing those things. And I think there's probably some confusion or misunderstanding. Right. Because uh, they shouldn't be tied to the GA at all. Okay. And uh, just one more thing. Could you repeat the two places you said to look for GA? Uh, yes, on our website, under current students, you'll see um, the, grad, the Grad Rebel Success Center. 
And that's really sort of our virtual place where we have all these different supports for current students like you now. Um, so there, there's a careers link, and it will be listed there. The same uh, J positions will be listed under career services. If you go to UNLV Career Services, and there's like a job link. Uh, I don't remember exactly what it's called. Actually, do you find can't remember what career services is called? Anyway, it's a place to search for available positions, and GAs are listed in there. And then, of course, if you know folks around campus, it can't ever hurt to ask if they're hiring GAs for various offices. It's, I'm unfortunately very focused into, into my department, yeah. so it's very, I'm, I, you know, I've been nowhere on campus, okay. um, even though I've been here. But then those would be two good places just to keep an eye out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we, we got timed out there. Otherwise, I was going to try to pull up the, the website. But as you heard, the Grad Rebel Success Center, go to one of the last links, and you'll see a handful of things. Elizabeth, could you add anything in this vein? Um, no, just like the Career Center is where I looked mostly. Also, on this wall right here on the other side, they post a lot of GAs. Oh, great. Yeah, so those are great. the only two places. Thank you. Can and there are surprises. You know, and this is where, if you're plugged in, there may be a surprising opportunity that emerges. So just ask your colleagues, but those are some other places to look. I asked Elizabeth because she got some funding last spring yeah. by happenstance. Yeah, great. <laughs> I love those stories. Thank you. I'm a little interested in the software you mentioned um, and how it ties into the resources that you have in the library. Um, that software, the eNote or the EndNote? And no, you can download that too. Okay. Uh, here at the library. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, this is probably a good moment then to, to stop and uh, thank our panelists for their presentations today. I right, well, appreciate you guys taking the time out to, uh, to share your words of wisdom. And for all of you for coming, hope this has been valuable. And uh, good luck on your uh, graduate and professional degree success. Yes, Pathways good luck. to success. Have fun. <laughs>